Welcome to the service of worship for Sunday, January 10th, 2021 at Dune. Thank you to Bev and Nancy for recording the music, to John for distributing this video, and for Kingsley for editing all of the many parts together and for making it possible for us to view it as a whole. We hope that as we celebrate and mark the baptism of our Lord, you will find this service to be meaningful and encouraging. We light the Christ candle each week to remind us that the light and life of Jesus shines into the world and is with us every day. As God's people, it is our privilege to take the light and life of salvation made possible through Christ with us into all of our daily life. We will join together in our call to worship. God's voice speaks to our chaos, echoing in our empty hearts, gathering us together to remember our baptism. God's voice flows like the living waters of grace, our new name, beloved, resounding in our souls. God's voice stirs the waters of hope, calling us to be bearers of hope in a world of broken hopes. We worship you inviting and redeeming God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's share the peace of Christ. Peace before us, peace behind us, peace under our feet. Peace within us, peace above us, may all around us be peace. May the peace of Christ be with you.
join in our morning prayer. Let's pray. Eternal Father, you gave us your only son, Jesus, who took our nature upon himself, and you've revealed him to us at his baptism in the River Jordan. Help us who've been adopted as your children through grace to be renewed each day by the Holy Spirit so that we can love you more deeply and serve you more faithfully and know you more fully. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit now and forevermore, and who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. today I want to talk about baptism and remember our baptism. Remember my baptism, that's the name of the children's story. I think that a lot of the children or, or teenagers associated with our church have probably been baptized, but they probably don't remember their baptism because in the Presbyterian Church we baptize children. If you've been baptized, ask your parents to tell you about your baptism. What was it like? Who was there? Where did it happen? Who performed your baptism? And if you haven't been baptized yet, maybe that's something you want to think about. That's something that I could do for you, that we could chat about sometime. Baptism is an important time because in baptism, our parents, if we're a child, or we, if we're old enough to decide for ourselves, say that we would like to follow Jesus, that we want to live our lives in obedience to him according to his promises. But if we were baptized when we were babies, or very small, how are we supposed to remember? The way that we remember is by having other people tell us about it, about the time and the place and the way in which we were brought into God's family. In baptism, we are reminded that we belong to God and that we belong to his family, the church, that all of us, whether we are baptized in a Presbyterian church, a Catholic church, a Lutheran church, a Baptist church, a Pentecostal church, no matter what kind of church, all of us who are baptized in any Christian church are part of one family, God's family. And that's a very exciting thing. It's a big family, it's a global family. 
It's a family that we can never be kicked out of. It is God's family. And that is a beautiful thing. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, the baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Our second reading is from Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 7. Paul in Ephesus. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on him, on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I start my sermon, I want you to stop the video for a moment. And I want you to go and get a small bowl or container of water. And once you have it, I want you to bring it back and then press play and continue because you'll need that small container of water at the end of the sermon. Do you remember your baptism? The answer for many of you will be no, because it took place when you were a baby. But there are some of you who will remember your baptism, either because you were baptized in a different denomination, or because for some other reason you were baptized when you were older. I remember my baptism because I was 12 years old when I was baptized, and it was a big deal. First of all, in order to get baptized, I had to meet with my pastor, and that involved lunch out with my minister at Pizza Delight, which I was pretty excited about. During that conversation over lunch, we talked about my faith, why I wanted to be baptized, why I felt I was ready to be baptized, and he decided that I understood fully what I was doing. I understood that in baptism I was professing publicly that I wanted to follow Christ and that I was committing my life to that. So when I was 12 years old, I wore something like a choir rope and I climbed into a tank full of lukewarm water at the front of my church and I was dunked in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I was baptized. And I remember afterwards having a new awareness that I belong to God and should try and live for him. I remember trying extra hard to pay attention during church, to listen and squirm less during the sermon, to uh, grow more in my faith, to try and remember to read my Bible and things like that. That moment shaped me. I thought of it a lot of times later in my adolescence and in my life afterwards. It shaped me being baptized. It was a moment when I really sort of decided that I needed to start being serious about my faith. I also remember the first time that I baptized a baby, myself as a minister. Her name was Navy, and she was as good as gold, and I was pretty nervous. There's a lot of responsibility the first, there's a lot of responsibility in baptizing a baby. There's a lot to think about. There's microphones, there's cords, there's babies, there's water. There's a lot of things to think about. But my baptism of Navy was a very meaningful experience and it went really well. Navy didn't cry, I didn't drop her, I said all of the right words, all pivotal and keywords. Uh, I didn't get water on the mic, 
And when I walked her through the congregation so that they could welcome her, her Navy's four siblings came with her too. And it was beautiful. The congregation greeted them as well. Then there was the first time that I baptized an adult. Because as Presbyterians, we can baptize both children and adults. We can baptize anyone at any stage. The first time I baptized an adult, it was a woman in her 50s. She thought she had been baptized as a child, but realized that she had not been, and this really bothered her. And when I made the water cross on her forehead, tears of joy streamed down her face. Now, when it came time to carry her through the congregation so they could welcome her, I walked her through instead, holding her hand. And as I did, she was met with hugs and smiles by the congregation she had been attending for a number of years. And it was a truly beautiful moment, very meaningful. Because there's no way around it, baptism is a special time in the life of those parents who bring their child to receive it, in the life of those adults or teenagers who come to receive it, in the life of the minister who is administering it, and for the congregation that witnesses it, baptism is a special time. It's one of two sacraments that we hold as Presbyterians. A sacrament is what we understand as a visible sign of God's abundant grace. Things that we can see and touch and experience. We can see and touch the water and we can eat and drink the wine and bread of our other sacrament, communion. We can feel them, we can take them into ourselves. And in so doing, we physically remind ourselves of the, of the spiritual truth of God's love for us, that it is deep and wide and that he is willing to go to great lengths in order to make us his. The story of Jesus' baptism is one that shows up in three of the four gospels in the New Testament. And all three of the accounts show essentially the same details. Matthew's, which we heard today, is the longest and provides the most context for the event. In it, we read that Jesus' cousin John has been traveling around the countryside of Judea preaching and offering baptism as a sign of repentance. Encouraging people to turn away from their sin and come back to a faithful obedience of God. And one day while he's baptizing the crowds, Jesus comes and says, John, I want you to baptize me. And they get into a little bit of back and forth. And John says, no, 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 I shouldn't baptize you. You should baptize me. No, no, I want you to baptize me, John. And they have this bit of back and forth. And finally, John agrees to baptize Jesus. And as John brings Jesus up out of the water, the clearest and most beautiful picture of the Trinity takes place. One of the clearest portrayals of the Trinity that we have in all of scripture takes place. As Jesus comes up out of the water after his baptism, the Spirit of God descends like a dove and lands on his shoulder. And God the Father speaks from the heavens in a loud voice and says, This is my dearly beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Or as another translation says, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. In a rare moment, we see God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together in a, beautiful, in a beautiful picture. The baptism of Jesus is a significant event in his life and ministry. Receiving from baptism from John is the first thing that the grown-up Jesus does before kicking off his ministry. Before he calls his first disciples, before he performs his first miracle, before he delivers his first sermon or tells his first parable, Jesus is baptized by John. And we have to ask ourselves why. I believe the answer is twofold. First, Jesus' baptism affirms his identity as God's son and not simply the son of Joseph, the carpenter from Nazareth. As Jesus comes up out of the water and the voice from heaven speaks, and the spirit lands on him, there's a public unveiling of just exactly who Jesus is and who he belongs to. He is God's son and God loves him. And not only that, 
But it's a safe bet that nearly everyone who heard that proclamation from the heavens and nearly everyone who saw that dove land right on his shoulder would have went away in awe and told others what they had seen. The, the witness to this proclamation would have spread quickly. Could it really be that Jesus, Mary and Joseph's boy, was sent by God? These events, though, didn't just proclaim to the crowd that Jesus was God's son. It also reminded Jesus himself that though he was present on earth and had taken the limitations of humanity for a time, the love of the Father and the presence of the Spirit still remained with him. Secondly, Jesus' baptism, with its reminder of his identity, also prepared Jesus for what was to come. The story that immediately follows the baptism of Jesus in all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is his temptation. For 40 days, we will find Jesus alone in the wilderness, and the devil will torment him, tempting him, trying desperately to get Jesus to give up on the mission for which he was sent. If the devil can convince Jesus to sin, then he takes away his ability to die in our place. In those moments, Jesus' clear sense of his identity, reinforced no doubt by the recent events of his baptism, and his knowledge of scripture prevent the devil from being successful in thwarting his mission. And Jesus is also on the brink of beginning a very public, very hectic, and very controversial ministry that will last for three years and that he knows is going to end in death. If there was ever a time when someone might need to be reminded of their identity, it would seem that this might be it. Just as Jesus' baptism was about identity, so is ours. 25 years ago, the animated film Toy Story came out and it was an instant hit. Kids and adults alike have enjoyed it for the entire 25 years and it spawned three subsequent sequels. And in it are two primary, there's a lot of characters in it, but two main characters, Woody and Buzz Lightyear. Uh, in the original movie, we meet Woody, a good-hearted cowboy, who belong, cowboy doll, I should say, who belongs to a young boy named Andy. But Woody begins to, Andy begins to see, no. But Woody begins to see his position as Andy's favorite toy jeopardized when Andy's parents give him a Buzz Lightyear action figure for his birthday. What's worse is that Buzz Lightyear actually thinks he's a real spaceman on a mission to return to his home planet. When Andy's family moves to a new house, Woody and Buzz are left behind because they've been kidnapped by the neighbor kid, Sid, and they have to escape in order to be reunited with their boy. By the end of the movie, after a lot of adventure and hijinks, Woody and Buzz do get reunited with Andy, and in the process, they've become best friends. In the middle of the crisis in the movie, Woody is seen to be looking at the bottom of his foot where Andy has written his own name, Andy, in permanent marker, on the bottom of, his, of Woody's foot to claim him. And this gives Woody comfort. It reminds Woody that no matter what other toys come into the bedroom or Andy's life, Woody still belongs to him. Woody is still Andy's toy. Buzz, it turns out, also ends up with Andy's name on the bottom of his foot in permanent marker. It is how Andy marks and claims them as his. In the same way, baptism is how we publicly proclaim that we have been marked and claimed by God, that we belong to him. Identity as God's children is at the core of our practice of giving and receiving baptism as Christians today. When parents bring their children to be baptized, they're promising on behalf of the children to raise them in faith as followers of Jesus until those children can choose for themselves to either accept or reject that faith. When people come as teenagers or adults to receive baptism, 
They're proclaiming that they desire to follow Christ and that they identify themselves with God in his ways. In baptism, we publicly declare and remind one another who we belong to. Baptism, whether of an adult or an infant, assures us that we belong to God. It reminds us, in the words of the Heidelberg Catechism, that our greatest comfort is that we belong to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's also a sign that we belong to his family and to his church. Whatever the practice or the mode of baptism, no matter how much water we use, whether we sprinkle, make a cross on the forehead, or dunk someone entirely, whether we do it in a tank with a baptismal font in a stream, no matter what or how we do it, the spirit is present in the act and the event is infused with the possibility of a new beginning to follow Jesus and do God's will. It's the beginning of a journey of faith that's meant to deepen throughout our lives. When we receive our baptism, when the water cross is placed on our infant or adult forehead in the Presbyterian tradition, it's like God's written his name on the bottom of our foot in permanent marker. Just as Jesus' baptism with his declaration that he was God's son prepared him for the ministry that he was to do, so our baptism is to shape our understanding of how we live in the world. We are to live wet. The image of water is a powerful one. God's always spoken to me through it. It's cleansing and renewing power has always resonated for me. Throughout scripture, God often uses water to cleanse the world of what's evil. For example, in the flood and in the Exodus, God freed Israel from bondage through the water of the sea. And the promised savior arrived to us through the waters of a woman's womb. So the imagery of water washing away and making clean is a good one for the process of continually being made new and continually being forgiven and continually being transformed as we live out the promises made on our behalf or made by us when we were baptized. When we are baptized, there is no guarantee that we will, continue, that we will not sin. In fact, we will continue to sin. Each of us, whether we have been a longtime member of the faith or are a new believer, is caught in the pattern of constantly dying to sin and rising to new life in Christ. And this is where the Holy Spirit, whom Paul's so concerned with in Acts 19, comes into things. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us continually live out our identity as belonging to God, the identity we receive at baptism. To live out our baptism, to live wet, is to live out the, the reality of the identity we are given as members of God's household. Families and cultures have particular ways of doing things, of marking time, of acting and speaking and thinking and living. And as the family of God, it is no different. As we live out our baptism and remember it, remember that it happened and remember that someone loved us enough to make covenant promises with God, we live differently. We're not our own. We are marked out as belonging to a multi-generational, multicultural family the family of God. We belong to one another. These truths are meant to shape how we think about ourselves, each other, and how we live and act and move within the world. We are to be dripping and soaking wet in our living with these realities. Every aspect of our life is to show that we follow Jesus and are committed to his way even when that way is uncomfortable. Now I want you to get that small container of water that I asked you to get at the beginning. And I want it to place it in front, in, you to place it in front of you. So we are going to take a moment to affirm our baptism. And it doesn't matter if you were baptized Presbyterian or Lutheran or Catholic in an evangelical tradition, or if you haven't even been baptized at all. You can still take part in this if you'd like. At the time of baptism of a child or an adult, as Presbyterians, we ask a series of questions and I'm going to ask them now. As I do, if you're able to honestly answer yes, then I invite you to. In answering these questions, we have an opportunity to express before God and our family, our desire to remember our baptism or to commit ourselves to Christ, with thanks, 
and to commit ourselves to continue to live as someone who belongs to God and according to his ways. Following that, we will make a water cross on our hands as a symbol of our commitment. So here are the questions. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, who has been faithful to us in all generations, do you turn away from sin, renounce all evil powers in the world which rebel against God or oppose God's rule of justice and love? Yes, I do. Do you reject the ways of sin which separate you from the love of God? Yes, I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ, accepting him as Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Yes, I do. Do you desire independence on the Holy Spirit to mature as a Christian in the church, to seek the guidance of Christ as you listen for his word, to celebrate his death and life at communion, and to take part in his mission to the world? Yes, I do. Take a moment now and make a water cross on your own hand or on the hand of a family member to symbolize the commitment you have made. Let's join together in singing, Lord reign in me. of caring and concern. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the invitation to come and to follow you and to be part of your family. We thank you for the way that you have drawn us to yourself by the power of your Holy Spirit, made it possible for us to enter your family through salvation through Christ, and have embraced us with your deep and unfathomable love. We thank you for placing us in families that bless us and nurture us, that cause us to learn what it is to be accepted and known, and that help us to grow. And Lord, for those whose experience of family has not been this, we thank you for the blessing of extended and church families and chosen families and all others that fill those needs. We are thankful for the kindness that we know in friends and good neighbors and in others who come alongside us throughout the journey of life to provide joy and encouragement and to lift our souls. Father, we remember before you all those we know and those who are known to you alone, who are living with loss or illness, who are facing grief, depression or discouragement and to any other kind of emotional pain. 
we ask that you would bring your healing presence and peace to them through us and through your Holy Spirit so that they will be assured of your constant love and presence. We ask, Lord, that you would draw near to our leaders and citizens who are working for peace and justice, and that you would be with those who are trying to contain and heal the effects of the pandemic. That you would be with all those who are struggling to figure out what will come next as they look at loss of income and resources that you would be with those who are enacting policies and who are unfolding plans for our communities and that you would be with us who are making individual daily decisions about our own actions and health in the midst of this unusual dare i say unprecedented event we pray that you would continue to give each one of us wisdom and that you would continue to work toward through through wise and discerning people towards a solution to this enormous problem father we know that there are many things that burden each one of us and that you see and know these concerns too and in this brief silence we present to you some of our own prayers Lord, you are a God of compassion and mercy, a God of grace and love. And we thank you for your constant presence with us. Do we ask that you would continue to lead us and guide us and that, would we, and that we would be increasingly attentive to the things that you have to say to us. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Each week it is our privilege to bring to the Lord gifts of time and talent and finance that we can bring to him in thankfulness for all that he gives to us. Let us pray now to dedicate these offerings. Generous and gracious God, we have received so much from you in Christ and in creation. Bless the gifts we offer this day, so they will speak of your love for the world in all its detail and for people in all our diversity. May our gifts touch the need around us in the name of Christ who makes us one. Amen.
head out from this time of worship into the week and all that it brings. Know that you do go with the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the guidance and presence of the Holy Spirit, today and every single day. Amen. Thank you. 